Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about Yemen with Arwa Mokdad, a peace advocate at Yemen Relief and Reconstruction Foundation. You can see YemenFoundation.org and an MPhil candidate at the University of Oxford researching conflict mediation within Yemen. Arwa Mokdad, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you for having me. So you were just in Yemen. Uh, what did you learn? What is the situation there with regard to the war and the blockade and the effects of the war and the blockade? Yeah, so I just got back from Sana'a, one of the few flights that are allowed into the country. I think that was the most shocking. There's only three flights a week allowed to Yemen to Sana'a airport. And this is completely unacceptable. And these flights only go to Jordan, which is quite expensive for the average Yemeni. When I was in Jordan, I met Yemenis who've been stuck there for months waiting for tickets. Within the country, there's cautious optimism. People are seeing a semi-quasi unofficial truce between the Houthis and the Saudis and are hoping this continues. People are really ready for peace. The situation on the ground is dire and we need change. And these flights, we're talking about necessary resources coming into Yemen and people who need to go to foreign hospitals getting out of Yemen? So these flights are completely commercial. So it depends if you can afford a ticket. For example, my ticket from London to Jordan was just as expensive as my ticket from Jordan to Yemen. The average Yemeni cannot afford this. When I was on the flight, there was four people who needed medical assistance, but it was very clear that they had some sort of donors. Because again, the average Yemeni, especially someone who's sick, cannot afford these tickets. And this is in a country where supplies still have a hard time getting in and where hospitals have been bombed? Yeah, so within Yemen, the Saudi-led coalition has bombed hospitals, including MSF hospitals and food supply. Uh, we still struggle to get in essential items such as medicine, oil. So, for example, only 40 percent of the oil needs for Yemen are allowed into the country. Yet the Biden administration is claiming there is no blockade. And, and the port and ships, are they getting in? Again, limited supply. It's nowhere near the need of Yemenis, which is especially crucial given the fact that 80% of the population requires humanitarian assistance. And, and is that the extent of the war now? Is the blockade and flights overhead? Or is there bombing? Is there violence still? So that's really interesting. It depends on the area you're in within Yemen. So within Sana'a, I would say on the ground, it's pretty stable. Uh, I remember being very shocked. So we're under sanctions. We can't use bank systems. Everything has to be paid in cash. And my cousin was walking around with a giant wad of cash. And I was like, Sophia, please hide this. <laughs> what are you doing? And she's like, this is completely acceptable. Like, no one's going to stop us. And it was true. You could walk around holding money. You were not sensing violence. There wasn't fighting on the ground within Sana'a. I will say the South is pretty unstable and there's still contested areas within Yemen. Depends on which faction is backing you. So it's a war zone with a blockade, but it's safer than a U.S. city? Shockingly, in some ways, yes. I mean, it's still a police state. I'm not going to be discussing politics while I'm in the streets of Sana'a, but I'm not worried about being robbed. I'm currently in New York, so <laughs> it's definitely something I have on my mind. You, you you use the first person plural, we, when you are talking about being in Yemen. You're, you have Yemeni heritage, Yemeni background. Yes. So my family, my entire mom's side lives in Yemen, in Sana'a. So going back, it was beautiful because I haven't seen my family since 2014, once the airport closed. But it was also heartbreaking to realize due to a conflict, I haven't been able to see my loved ones. And... The uh, U.S. government has had an enormous role for many years in this war and in the so-called drone war that came before the real war. What, uh, what has been the U.S. role and how has it changed? Yeah, so like you said, the U.S. was involved in drones even prior to the war and was supporting longtime authoritarian President Ali Abdullah Saleh. Uh, now, with the Saudi-led coalition, the U.S. was supporting weapon sales, giving intelligence, 
whatever it may be. And we're now seeing the U.S. pressuring the Saudis to remain within Yemen, with Lunder King going as far as saying this impacts stability in the region for the Houthis to be in charge. Obviously, the Houthis are not an ideal government in any way in Yemen. But if nine years of war have not taken them out of power, what's another nine years going to do? It's a good question. Uh, it, it seems that Saudi Arabia is increasingly the top U.S. weapons buyer, the key U.S. partner in the war on Russia, the key U.S. slash Israeli ally in Western Asia. And despite candidate Joe Biden having campaigned on standing up to Saudi Arabia, he's pretty much rolled over and whimpered. Uh, what, what can be done about this U.S. deference to Saudi Arabia? And what has Joe Biden done versus what he's claimed to do? Like you said, when Joe Biden was on the campaign trail, he claimed to make that he was going to make MBS a pariah on the world stage. Uh, that's completely not happened. The minute he was in office, he was singing a different tune uh, with little gains, to be honest. Yes, Saudi Arabia continues to aid the U.S. within the Middle East, but they haven't adjusted oil prices or did any of these promises that Biden was hoping for. So I call on my fellow Americans to reach out to their representatives and let them know that this is unacceptable. We cannot continue pursuing war within Yemen. It's been nine years of conflict and it's only increased tensions. Let's give peace a chance. And a couple of years ago, when it had been about seven years of conflict, there were Democrats in both houses of Congress who thought it was an urgent moral crisis to immediately take every possible step to cut off U.S. weapons and, uh, and cooperation and assistance to Saudi Arabia in this war. And as soon as there was a Democrat in the White House, uh, something was changed. Uh, and when Senator Bernie Sanders, nonetheless, after waiting many months, was going to take action in the Senate, an announcement from the White House uh, caused him to drop that. What is it that the White House has actually done, if anything, to earn this you know, complete switching off of this urgent moral action? It's been quite disheartening to see the shift, right? Especially from our Democrats who have been, we've been working closely with as activists to suddenly be pushing the brakes on everything without due reason. I mean, Biden and the administration has been continuing to push for war in Yemen. This idea that the Houthis are gonna undermine regional stability, what's truly gonna undermine regional instability is the largest humanitarian crisis in the world. This is radicalizing people. This is increasing hunger within the country. Arwa, Mokda, did you see the recent study uh, comparing Western corporate media coverage of war in Yemen with war in Ukraine, uh, in which it was found that most reports on the war in Ukraine use the active voice and assign blame, as in Russia bombed this town, but most reports on the war in Yemen have used the passive voice and never mentioned who did it as if it were a police shooting, as in Yemen was bombed. Yeah. Who knows who? What do you make of that uh, media coverage? It's quite disheartening, uh, but it also makes sense. Saudi Arabia is paying for lobbyists, right? They have money in a lot of newspapers. They're able to influence what public opinion is. Also the US, this does not look good for them if their weapons are being used to bomb school buses, food manufacturers, as well as funerals, weddings. I mean, there's been truly nothing untouched within Yemen. It was really interesting when I was in Sana'a and traveling around the country in general, seeing buildings that have been absolutely destroyed and you look at this, at first you're like, this is a school, right? This is not a military target. This should have never been bombed. But also the irony of whatever you use to bomb this building is more expensive than the building itself. The, the phrase you used a moment ago, which I heard constantly two or three years ago and prior, greatest uh, humanitarian crisis in the world, seemed to vanish a couple of years ago. I mean, was that because there was a different party in the White House or because the war in Ukraine had white people dying or because there was a truce and the violence was lessening or, or some combination? 
It's a combo. I think for many people, there's a truce, right? So the Saudis have not resumed bombing. There's been some occasional bombing, but not the same level I was, it was at the beginning of the war. So for them, it's over. But for us, it isn't. We're still living under blockade with the constant fear of the bombing continuing. This is not a way. This limbo period is purgatory. Yemen needs to move forward. And like you said, Ukraine has impacted this a lot. Media attention has shifted. Even at Yemen Relief and Reconstruction Foundation, you can see once the war broke out in Ukraine, our funds and our donations decreased uh, significantly. And I get it, there's a new crisis or something else in the news cycle. So of course, people are shifting their money to that. Um, and it's important to support all causes, but it is quite depressing to see what makes more attention and what doesn't. For, for years, I have had people from Yemen uh, and experts about Yemen on this program and other webinars and involved in activist campaigns and rallies and conferences uh, with relatively little corporate media interest about the, the victims, the children hiding under their desks as if they're idiots living in the 1950s in the United States thinking that nuclear bombs won't hit them if they're under their desks, but actual horror and terror of the constant drone buzzing over their heads. Uh, and as soon as there was a war in Ukraine, we got what many of us have wanted for decades, uh, coverage of war victims with, with their stories, with their friends, with their pets, with, you know, uh, what have you, what has been your impression uh, of seeing coverage of war victims of the sort that many of us have wanted to see for both sides of dozens of wars for many years and we're only just now seeing for one side of one war yeah it's a double standard completely right uh, what lives we prioritize what lives we're willing to discuss and what stories we're willing to tell right you're more likely to discuss um right a ukrainian girl who lost her pet bunny than a yemeni kid who did the same. But the thing is, whatever stories we're seeing about war, they're universal. Whatever people are experiencing in one conflict, they're probably experiencing in another. So I really hope people keep this in their mind, that Yemenis are suffering in the same way, but it's also inaccessible to get these stories, right? Three flights a week, and only if you're a Yemeni national. How are reporters even going to get in to cover this? You've, you've written in the past about a bias in Western media against uh, reporting on Yemen by people who actually know something about Yemen or are from Yemen. Uh, what, what has been your experience with that? Yeah, there's this weird double standard within this industry of Middle East experts where, yes, they claim they want more Middle Eastern perspectives, and I think it's true to a certain extent, but more so those that toe the line. Because the minute you start disagreeing, it's this idea of, oh, you're biased, uh, which is ironic because obviously everyone is biased. We all have our biases, but as professionals, we move past those. Um, so these accusations that Middle Eastern experts, especially those who are against the war, uh, I know my fair share of colleagues have been accused of being a Houthi, um, which used to be designated as a terrorist group. I mean, that's such an Islamophobic accusation. And just for saying war is bad completely unacceptable. Yeah, it's uh, it, that also has is universal, I think happens in, in, in every war, uh, you're accused of backing one side or the other. Um, the, the, the strange thing is that the, that the war hasn't ended in the sense of Yemen having a legitimate, stable government has it? Uh, I, I mean, what is what is going to be the the end game here? That's what we need to be considering. Right now, Yemen is quite divided, and that's partly due to outsiders. So you have the North, which is run by the Houthis, but then you have the South that's funded, the SDC, they're called, the uh, that want a separate southern state, and that's funded by the UAE. So there's concerns moving forward of What's a Yemeni Yemeni peace process going to look like if foreigners aren't willing to pull out the country fully? It's a very very good question. Um, the uh, the other concern I have as temperatures soar is is really how long it's going to take before governments in Western Asia set aside some of their uh, some of their battles between each other and realize that the entire place is going to become uninhabitable. And what 
what happens then? The Gulf right now is unbearably hot. I used to live in Oman and I remember summer times there uh, reached a point where you were recommended not to go outside from 12 to 4. Luckily, Yemen is a bit better in the north because it's so mountainous. We're around 2200 meters of elevation. So we're hitting 80s for the first time. And this is very shocking for everyone. Yemen was not the south. The south, unfortunately, is getting much higher temperatures and doesn't have electricity. So you're really starting to see these impacts in the Middle East. And there was a lot of protests while I was in Yemen in the South about electricity, corruption, whatever it may be. Because if you're living under hot temperatures without AC, it's quite challenging. Do you expect uh, mass immigration, not just out of the region, but from low altitudes to higher? Potentially. Uh, Yemen, though, it's very hard for Yemenis to leave the country due to the blockade. So we're seeing people, most of those who are displaced are internally displaced. So I would see a lot of IDB camps while I was in Yemen. Um, but I do think we're going to see seasonal immigration in the Gulf. Already, a lot of my friends in Oman, for example, would buy summer homes in Turkey and spend their summers there. But as it continues to get hotter and hotter, I think we're going to see a real shift in the region. And I hope our leaders start to prioritize climate change instead of waging unnecessary wars on their neighbors. One would like to see governments around the world do that. You you, <laughs> you spoke, uh, Arwa, mocked that of working closely with Democrats, although, you know, predictably and consistently <laughs> with other issues, doesn't actually get you very far. Uh, it, it, are people considering any sort of a new approach uh, of, of independent pressure on the U.S. government? Uh, because it seems that, uh, you know, the most that Democrats are going to ask themselves to do uh, is to make false promises in another campaign. Uh, and people are going to cheer for that or be accused of loving Trump, just as they might be accused of being Houthis. And so uh, is, is something else possible in terms of activism? I think the two biggest things Americans can do, first, donate, right? Yemenis need aid, but a country of 30 million cannot survive on aid alone. The second thing is really pressuring our politicians to push for peace. That means pushing for an end of the blockade. That's the biggest ask. We're talking about the largest humanitarian crisis in the world and still under blockade. Completely unacceptable. This is a war crime. And the US was involved in creating the situation, selling the weapons that resulted in this which makes us liable as well. We're, our fingers are in the pot since the beginning. The war was announced from DC, not Riyadh. We have a big role to play and the American public, I truly hope takes that call. And when we say Congress, Mr. President, Department of State, end the blockade, and they say, haven't you heard President Biden said there is no blockade. <laughs> How does one reply to that without being a Trump lover or in the pay of Vladimir Putin, but but uh, respectfully reply to that lie? Yeah, it, it's it feels, I don't even know how to describe it, double think, right? Denying reality. As someone who just got out of Yemen with three flights a week, how can you say there's no blockade? It's so absurd. Um, but I think it would be pressuring of, I've seen reports, there's still only three flights a week to Sana'a, still only 40% of the oil needs. These, this is clearly conditions of a blockade, even if it's been eased. Yeah, and, and donations, you said, can people donate through the Yemen Relief and Reconstruction Foundation or where can they donate? Yeah, Yemen Relief and Reconstruction Foundation, we're very involved in aid on the ground. $45 can feed a family of six for a month. And these food baskets that we distribute, which is one of our biggest um, projects, is all local products to support the local economy. But in general, we also do school supplies, um, orphan support, vocational training for youth. But the biggest thing right now is just food. But I hope if Yemen the blockades lifted, peace becomes an option that we can focus on reconstruction, not just emergency aid. Is, is there any is there any thinking to green energy reconstruction as opposed to this this need to get more oil past a blockade? Actually, ironically, due to the lack of oil in the country, Yemen and Sana'a especially became quite solar. So a lot of solar energy in my grandfather's house, actually how we get hot water is via solar panels. So Yemeni started building solar panels in response to the blockade 
to which then the Saudis ban the products that allow us to bake solar panels. So it's a challenging situation right now, but you are seeing the shift within Yemen due to the oil crisis to solar energy. And I hope that continues. Is that is that something that can be communicated uh, to Washington, D.C., that Saudi Arabia is is blocking the parts for solar panels uh, to get into Yemen? I mean, they have all of this information. It's hard for me to believe they don't see that we only have three flights a week to send out. So at this point, it's not about sharing the info anymore. It's about reaching out to our representatives so they talk to them. They, they know what's happening. I, I truly believe they're intelligent enough to know. So it just, do they have the conscience to act on it? Is it is it a question in part of people not seeing what they're paid not to see? Uh, does it matter that Saudi Arabia funds so many universities and stink tanks and media outlets and uh, so much of the, of the culture of the United States? Yeah. Saudi Arabia has a huge influence in DC and these cities, media, whatever it may be. And that allows as well. But also, like I noted, Yemen uh, is inaccessible. How do you get in, especially foreigners? They don't have access, only three flights a week. Even prior to the war, no one really knew what Yemen was. And that makes this conflict a lot easier to uh, brush under the rug. I remember growing up when I would tell people I was Yemeni, they would go, what's Yemen, to which I'd respond, oh, you know, like Egypt. <laughs> but that helps a lot. So I hope also we can view Yemen outside of this prism of conflict. Right now we're going through a hard time, but it's one of the most uh, ancient civilizations in the world. It's my favorite place in the world. When you walk in Sana'a in the old city, you feel like you're walking in a history textbook. Um, so there's a lot to be preserved, not just for the sake of Yemen, but the loss of this culture and this heritage is a loss for humanity. Absolutely. Um, you know, for years, there was what they called a successful drone war uh, right. in Yemen. And many of us were saying, end it, end it. Uh, and when we would talk with ordinary people, they would, they would say, don't you think a drone war is better than a regular war? Because in a drone war, nobody gets killed. And, and of course, you know, there's the question of who counts as nobody. But, uh, but we were saying, no, uh, we'd rather have no war. And the drone war is going to produce a regular war. Listen to the Yemenis who are saying that this is making things worse, not who were testifying yeah. before Congress, this is making things worse. Uh, it, has that has that lesson ever been ever made it into Western media that perhaps the drone war wasn't that successful and may have contributed to the current crisis? I think there's starting to be this understanding that we've made a lot of missteps in the Middle East. I mean, there's no way to look at the situation on the ground and truly any Middle Eastern country and think we were on the right course. Um, but the drone war in particular, and again, Yemen is one of the most, I would say forgotten countries in the Middle East. The, even the war now, which is the largest humanitarian crisis in the world is called the forgotten war. So it's difficult to say that there's been this consciousness about the drone war. I don't think most people even know there was a drone war in Yemen, um, but it's left its mark on us. And it's truly politicized groups and militarized groups that should have not been militarized. Right, and this anti-Western sentiment has increased throughout the region, and these sort of decisions played a big role in that. What can what can people do uh, to to educate others about? I mean, is there an opportunity in the attention that's been paid to the war in Ukraine to say, yes, there's a problem with wars. Let's look at some of the other wars that have that have been going on and are still going on and are in many cases by many measures worse than the war in Ukraine. How do we how do we do that? I think this is a huge opportunity for the West to see what's happening in Ukraine. Uh, and it's so sad to say this, but silver linings, right? And see the tactics Russia is using and understanding we've used similar tactics. And I think you're seeing this in the African non-alignment movement, where a lot of countries in Africa have been not really taking a side. And because they're saying the US has done the same. So if other countries around the world are being skeptical about this in the sense of skeptical of American criticism and whatnot. Maybe we should be taking a deep look in the mirror and wondering why when there's an active invasion occurring, a lot of countries aren't willing to side with us. That's shocking. And unfortunately, Ukrainians are paying the price for America's mistakes. 
but maybe we should learn as well. So this can't happen in the future. We have just a couple of minutes left. Arwa, Mokdad, what can people do to help and learn about the Yemen Relief and Reconstruction Foundation? And what are you, what are you working on uh, coming up? Yeah, so Yemen Relief and Reconstruction Foundation, YemenFoundation.org. Please check out our website, see the projects. If you have any questions, we also have an information page within it. Uh, and donate, <laughs> really. Uh, we also are always looking for volunteers because we have two prongs. One is, of course, direct aid and efforts on the ground within Yemen, but also lobbying here within the U.S. to try to push for the U.S. to take an anti-war stance. And Yemen right now is in a limbo period, and I think with the activism of Americans, we can really shift this to long-lasting peace within the country. Yemen deserves this, right? This war was completely unnecessary. None of the aims were achieved. So it's time for peace. Um, and moving forward, Yemen Relief is excited to be involved in reconstruction within the country. Uh, direct aid, again, is not enough. A country of 30 million cannot survive on aid alone. But by lifting the blockade, Yemen can have a future. Very well said. We've been speaking with Arwab Mokdad, who is a peace advocate at the Yemen Relief and Reconstruction Foundation. The website, again, is YemenFoundation.org. We will have that link and links to various articles by Arwa up at talkworldradio.org. Arwa Mokdad, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you for your time. Much appreciated. In August 2022, I wrote, every single member of Congress is willing to let Yemeni children die. A single member of the House or Senate can compel a speedy vote on ending U.S. participation in the war on Yemen. Not one single member has done so. Ending U.S. participation would effectively end the war. Despite the temporary truce, millions of lives depend on ending the war and the passionate speeches in 2018 and 19 by senators and representatives demanding an end to the war when they knew they could count on a veto from Trump vanished during the Biden years chiefly because party is more important than human lives. Since writing this, I've been given three excuses. Here they are with my replies. A joint resolution is better than a concurrent one, a concurrent one being the kind that a single member can force to a vote. But a concurrent resolution would force a debate and vote that could be followed by a joint resolution. And it would only take two people, one from each house, to force a vote on a joint resolution. Nancy Pelosi decreed that nobody could force any peace votes during COVID. Although Rules Committee Chair Jim McGovern said he would ignore that illegal decree. And if he's ignoring it, why shouldn't we? And three, it's better to threaten action than to actually act, because when you act, there's always some slight chance of failing, even though you already had the votes when it was all for show and you could count on a Trump veto. Well, this is wrong and sickening, because starving people need the war ended so that human needs can be properly dealt with. And because we need the example of ending a war in order to end additional wars. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.